Well, welcome once again. Uh, uh, this is session eight, part two uh, of our Forerunner School class, uh, uh, A Theology of the Bride. Uh, the, the title of this session is The Bride and the Writings of Paul, part two. Uh, if you're part of the school, you've already uh, probably ta or watched or uh, studied session eight, part one. Uh, the bride, uh, of the bride and the writings of Paul. And this is part two. As I said in part one, the, uh, we have two parts to this teaching. Uh, in part one, we looked at a few, primarily Ephesians chapter five and other writings of Paul to, to try to answer that question. Does Paul say that, or believe or write, that every born again believer will be the eternal wife of Christ? Um, you know, if you, as like I said in session part one, that if you, uh, on a cursory look at it, it almost seems like he's saying that the entire uh, church will be the eternal wife of Christ, will be presented in equal amounts of glory, will be without spot or wrinkle, in equal measure, and will be holy and blameless. But as you begin to look at uh, the, what it says in Ephesians 5, what it says in the rest of the book of Ephesians and the other prison epistles and in uh, Paul's earlier writings, if you begin to look at all these things, you begin to see that uh, rather than uh, an equal level of that, he's stating a vision uh, for the church, that it's God's purpose, it's God's plan, it's God's vision that every believer would be uh, would be. Uh, resurrected with the ultimate amount of glory and be the eternal wife, part of the eternal wife of Christ. Uh, but that there's a radical pursuit that is a part of that uh, that is necessary. We looked at that uh, in the last session to show that, uh, that he, Paul is not saying that every born again believer will, will be resurrected in equal amounts of glory or will be uh, equally made ready as the bride. But there's a radical pursuit of that. Now, in this part, part two of this session, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5 again. And in this uh, session, we're going to look at what Ephesians chapter 5 teaches us uh, about the bride being made ready in different pursuits and different aspects uh, of, of this. And so that's, that's our goal in part two. And I'm excited about this uh, uh, because this, this has some, there's some powerful truths in here that will encourage us. Uh, even in our, our weaknesses, our frailties, and we feel like it's impossible. Uh, you know, if Paul was worried about being disqualified, my goodness, uh, where do I stand in all that? Uh, and so uh, we, we want to look at some of, the, uh, some of the, uh, the points that are made in Ephesians 5 that I think will encourage us uh, that it is possible to be uh, made ready. Uh, so anyway, let me pray, and then we'll get into uh, this. Father, again, we thank you for this group, faithful saints that are persevering in this, and we ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon this teaching. We ask, Father, that you would just, uh, again, take me out of the way, speak to your people that you love so dearly, speak through me and in me, that we might become a people who are made ready for you on that day, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, this is uh, part two, session eight, part two, the bride uh, and the writings of Paul. And again, what we're going to do in this session is look at some of the teachings from Ephesians chapter five in terms of what it uh, teaches us. I think the, the main overall objective, we're going to look at different parts of this in this session. But the overall objective of this is that Ephesians chapter 5 teaches us about the role of Christ uh, in making us ready. You know, if you look at Revelation uh, 19, it says, you know, the bride has made herself ready. The bride has made herself ready you know, has given her the assignment to put on bridal garments, fine linen, and all of that. And so, you know, you see that in, in the other, uh, a lot of the other things we've looked at. But what we see in Ephesians chapter 5 is that we see the work of Christ uh, in our lives to facilitate making ourselves ready. 
And just even as I'm sharing, I'm getting chill bumps thinking, oh, how we need to know the work of Christ uh, in our lives to make ourselves ready. Even in our weaknesses, even in our frailties, even in our sin and those self-issues, those besetting issues that we feel like we can't really get victory over. Christ is working in us to make it happen because he loves us and he cares for us and all of that. And we're going to see that in this chapter like I think like never before or like in none of the other places. And it's so needed. It's so necessary. Uh, it, it's Yes, we do have to make ourselves ready, but it's like the, the Lord wants to meet us with his everlasting love and grace and mercy to make it happen. Um, <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me just start out. I want to share a dream that uh, uh, one of the ladies in our church had. Actually, I'm teaching this on a Monday afternoon to an empty room, and she had the dream. She shared it yesterday. We had uh, home group meetings and uh, on Sunday, and she shared... This She had had the dream Saturday night, so it's only like a couple of days old. Uh, but she said this, I dreamed uh, I was supposed to be a bridesmaid in a wedding. You know, fits in right with what we're teaching. And on the day of the ceremony, I was putting on my makeup, and it just looked like I was spreading mud on my face. Though I tried to make it better, I could not. I went into the bathroom to wash my face and someone came in and said, you better hurry, the wedding is about to start. Uh, and I didn't ma did not make it in time to be a part of the bridal party because she was called to be a bridesmaid. Uh, but I did get to watch the ceremony from the back. Now, there's a lot of implications in this, but what she said, and she said in the interpretation of it, was that she tried to, to put on her makeup to make herself ready, but she could not do it. It needed to be Christ doing it. She needed Christ doing it before her. She was helpless to do it on her own. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see here in Ephesians 5 is a very powerful truth there. Yes, all the things we've been talking about are true. We do have to make ourselves ready. But we need the work of Christ working in us to accomplish it. It's impossible apart from Christ doing it in us and through us. Uh, and so that's what Ephesians 5 says probably more than anything uh, is that it's, well, it's Christ's work, shows us Christ's work uh, in that. And so uh, we read this uh, section of Scripture a few minutes ago or, or in the last session uh, uh, but we want to uh, we, we want to read it again. So Ephesians five verse twenty five, uh, husbands love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. So we see a, a principle that we'll talk about here, and he gave himself up for her. Another principle, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even, to himself, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects or reverences her husband. Uh, and so uh, th that's the passage that we're going to draw these principles from. First one, first principle, there's a, the, the goal is stated in this chapter is a glorious church 
in full union with Christ, a glorious church in full union with Christ. In God's eternal purpose, Christ is to be, the preem is to be preeminent in, in, all, in all things and to have an equal partner who is holy, uh, is, who is holy and blameless. So that's, that's what God's plan is. is Christ is to be the center of all things. He's to be the preeminent one, preeminent in all things. Uh, that is the, before the foundation of the world. That was the plan of the Godhead to make Christ into all, these, all those things. But he is to have, he is to have an eternal partner uh, who is holy and blameless. You know, we go back in the last uh, session, part one, we talked about Ephesians chapter one, and we said, we said in the eternal counsel of the Godhead, it was predetermined that he would have a people who are holy and blameless. That is the goal. That is the goal. And Ephesians 5, again, lays out this beautiful, wonderful goal that Christ in his preeminent uh, purpose is to have a, a bride uh, who is made ready and who becomes a glorious representation of Christ without spot, without wrinkle, holy and blameless. And so what we see in chapter 5 and through all of Ephesians, again, this is somewhat of a review from the last session, is that we know that he is working to accomplish this uh, eternal, uh, eternal plan to have this glorious bride. This is the goal that he's working toward. And there's another aspect of that. There's another aspect of that. It's not to be a glorious, only a glorious bride. Because, you know, you could have uh, a, a glorious bride that was still distant from Christ. Uh, that she was in heaven, but that she still wasn't in that closest of intimacy. But the goal is not just to have a glorious bride. It's to have a glorious bride who is in full union with Christ. Uh, chapter 5, verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, for the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Now, this is a mystery. There's no doubt this is a mystery. Uh, you know, when I do marriage counseling, pre-marriage, pre-wedding marriage counseling, uh, I speak to, I use this verse, and I say, and the two should become one flesh. But it's more than just a physical union. That's part of it for sure. But there's also the spiritual and the soulless union. There's a, there's a, there's a oneness that comes in a, in a marriage relationship between a husband and a wife, uh, that they become one. They become one spiritually. They become one uh, in mind. They begin to think alike. They begin to, uh, to uh, have similar feelings towards things, and uh, friendships would be a friendship with each other. So there's a drawing together in oneness that happens between a husband uh, and a wife. Uh, and so what Paul is saying here is, yes, that, that's true, but he said what he's primarily speaking here about is this union between Christ and the church. That's the goal. Uh, yes, is there to be glorious. Yes, there to be resurrected like the sun or the moon and hopefully in the maximum fullness of Christ that they can be resurrected with to become the bride, the eternal wife of Christ. But there's more than just that. There's a oneness that, that's, that is there. And so that's what, that's what Paul is saying here. He's laying out the vision for this, that, that the bride is to be one uh, with, the, with the bridegroom. You know, we don't, we don't really understand it, but we know that even going back to Adam and Eve, that, that Eve was taken out of Adam. She was inside Adam. And, you know, when, she, when Adam was put in the deep sleep and, and Eve came forth from him, there's a, there's a picture there of, of what the bride of Christ is to be like, to come forth from within to be one with him. Uh, we see in, in uh, Jesus' high priestly parent, prayer in John 17, we see he talks about being one, being one with us, being one. And I think it's more, it's more than just being in unity. 
But if it's, in, it's being in the bosom or in the, in the heart of the Godhead. It's, the bride is intended to do that. And so that's the goal uh, that, that Christ wants his bride uh, to be glorious, equally yoked without spot or wrinkle, blameless in every way, but also to be one, to be one with him. That, they, that there's, a, there's a oneness that of intimacy that uh, is just a mystery. I, I, I know that I can't explain it, but I know whatever it is, I want it. I want to be a part of that. I want, to, I want that. I want that eternal uh, unity and intimacy w with him. I mean, we see a little bit of a touch of it in the, talking about the New Jerusalem because the New Jerusalem is a city, but it's also the bride, and Christ is right there in the midst of it. It's almost like there's a oneness there, uh, and that's an eternal partnership uh, that will take place there. So we see that in Ephesians 5. We see this, this unity and oneness there, and we see the glorious, blameless bride there as the vision and the goal. Now, let's go to the second point. Christ loves the church. God's eternal purpose is motivated by God's great love for his creation. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1 here for a minute. Again, this is the eternal purpose uh, book. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, the holy and blameless bride, in love, in love, in love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. In love, he predestined us. And I want to hit on this issue of in love. Uh, you know, it, it, like almost everything in the Bible, scholars different, disagree on uh, different things. But there is a, a lot of disagreement or different opinions on whether in love uh, should be part of the sentence before him. We should be blameless before him in love. Or should it be blameless before him, period, in love he predestined us. And so there's a difference of opinion there. Uh, and, you know, the commentaries that I agreed with, uh, John Stott was one uh, that uh, deals with this, and, and I thought he said good, uh, some good things about it. If you, if you put it in holy and blameless in love, it, it suggests that we're in love with Christ, and we're holy and blameless because we're in love with him. Uh, and so in love is the re result of the work of Christ. But if you put it in the second sentence, uh, blameless before him, period. In love, he predestined us. Love becomes the source of his work of predestination. So is, it, is love the result? Maybe it is, but it's also in this verse, the source, the source in love. In other words, yes, Christ had a predetermined plan, but he executes that plan in love. In other words, he loves you. He loves me. He loves his bride. He loves his creation. And he is motivated, he is motivated by his love. He is motivated by his love for us. Everything that he does is motivated uh, by Christ's love. Um, I want to read a quote from the book I wrote on the bride back in 2009. It's been a, quite a while ago. Uh, but this quote, uh, there was a chapter on the love of God, and uh, this is, I thought this was good, so I want to read it again. Uh, now as he waits for his bride to make herself ready, Jesus longs to have, a, to have greater intimacy and partnership with us. He is lovesick for us. With great emotion and passion, he desires us. Jesus is not a stoic who waits passively in heaven, indifferent to his wedding day. He is a passionate bridegroom who longs to be joined to his bride for all of eternity. Jesus loves us with the same love the Father has for him. So, the, the, all that 
God wants us to be ready and, and make ourselves ready. But everything that he does and calls us to is motivated by his love, by his love. Uh, to me, that's a powerful, powerful uh, statement. We love him because he first loved us. Now, in addition, or part of his love, Christ loves the church even to the point of dying for her to become his bride even to the point of going to the cross. Just, you know, Philippians deals with this, but you think about Jesus left the glory of heaven and he voluntarily chose to go to earth to live, to be born as a babe, to live as a man, fully God, but yet fully man, and to do it with one purpose, to, to die on the cross for his bride. You know, we dealt with this in session two, that the, the, the death, his death was Jesus paying the bridal dowry that allowed him to purchase his bride from the slave market and bring her into that betrothal relationship. And so in love, uh, in love, he, he um, paid the ultimate price to die for us. Let me read a quote from uh, John Stott again. Uh, in the above passage, or in the above passage, which is uh, Ephesians that we talked about, seem, uh, it, it seems to trace Christ's care for his church from a past to a future eternity. Certainly the words, Christ loved the church, preceding as they do the self-sacrifice on her behalf, seem to look back to the eternal pre-existence in which he set his love on his people and determined to come to save them. And so Christ, he, this love is really beyond our comprehension, but he wants, us to, he wants us to comprehend it. Christ wants his bride to deeply comprehend the level of love he has for his bride. You know, he wrote this in Ephesians 3, 17. Uh, you know, in love he predestined us. He, had, he initiated the predestined plan to provide, to make us ready as a bride. And in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, he says this. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of of God. He wants us to understand the love God has for us. And we need to do it. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that I've seen as you begin to deal with the theology of the bride and the making ready and all the different aspects of it, it's easy to, to, to drift into this realm where you really wonder if Christ really loves you. Does he really love me? Because I look and I, I know I need to make myself ready or I need to allow him to make me ready. But I see my sin. I see the, bes the besetting issues that I can't get victory over. I see my weaknesses. I see my frailties. And I think, is it ever possible for me to make myself ready? And I read passages like Paul wrote in, in Philippians where he says, I, I don't think I've attained it yet. This is toward the end of his life, and, uh, I, but I press on. And we need to do that as well. But it's easy to, when you get, you know, into that realm to really wonder, does Christ really love me? Because I see myself. And, and we have to guard ourselves against that because Christ loves us. He loves us. So much to leave heaven, so much to die for us that he loves us. And he, and in his love, he wants us to realize his love because it's the foundation. Now listen to me. It is the foundation by which we can make ourselves ready. We have to never lose sight of the idea and the understanding that Christ loves us. Ever so much he loves us. Um, so we see the goal. Now we see that his motivation is love. His motivation is love. Um, now we want to move into the next point. 
unfailing commitment. Unfailing commitment. Christ is committed to making his bride ready for, the, for their upcoming marriage. Christ is committed to that task. And that's so important to know. Sometimes you feel like, you know, Christ is just there waiting. Okay, will Ken make himself ready? We'll see. You know, it's almost like an, uh, a, 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 an uninterested bystander. And that's not the case, but we, sometimes we think that. But no, he is absolutely committed to make, to make his bride ready for the marriage. And so throughout our life, whatever we're going through, he is committed to making that happen. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't forget. He is making, he is committed to making his bride ready. When you read Ephesians 5, 25, it reads uh, through 7, 27, it reads like this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. Uh, and so, you know, in this passage, Christ uses these different verbs to show unfo his unfolding stages of his commitment to his betrothed bride. He loved her. He gave himself up for her to sanctify her, to cleanse her, that he might present her to himself. You know, Christ is committed first to his eternal purpose and to the, the purpose of the Godhead, but he's also committed in unwavering perseverance to purchase a bride and to make her ready as his eternal partner. His commitment is such that if a believer desires to be his eternal wife and responds to his leadership and promptings, Christ will make her ready as his eternal partner. You know, I, I, this is a little bit out of the off track, but I, I was reading this verse of scripture and this came to me from, uh, came back to me from Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Let me just read this. And we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose, I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. That's Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Uh, and this is a little bit, but I want to, uh, I'm, I'm, I have a point here. I want to make the point of Christ's unfailing commitment to what he calls us to. Uh, this ver these two verses of scripture, the Lord spoke those to me in 1983, 1983, so a long time ago. And I was still in business at that point in time and the Lord was in the process of, uh, and not yet, but in the process of calling me into full-time ministry. And we were in a class. Uh, it was called Master Life. It was a cl discipleship class, and we were taking it. I wasn't teaching it. I was taking it. And one of the things you had to do was get a life, life a scripture that describes your life purpose. And the Lord gave me this scripture verse back in 1983 that he called me to proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom to present every man complete in Christ or mature in Christ. Um, and, you know, at that point in time, I had no idea. I mean, I, what I, I thought I would if most be an associate pastor um, in a local church somewhere. But, you know, what I look back on, this was, what, 80, 40 years ago or whatever? I'm not sure exactly how many years ago that was. But without me even realizing it, the Lord led me through a series of uh, positions, uh, works of his spirit, different things, that now this is what I'm doing. That's what, I, that's what I devote my life to. And how he orchestrated all that 
is a, is a total mystery how he got me from where I was to where I am now. It's just a miracle. I mean, not that it's, I'm not saying it's some great thing and I'm not trying to make it sound uh, like it's some high and lofty thing that I've achieved, but how he led me through those steps is a miracle. It's a miracle to me. It just touched my heart and, and it, it, it just showed me his unfailing commitment to fulfill what he's called to do. So in love, and here's the point I want to make coming back to the teaching now. <coughs> here's the point. <coughs> in love, he never fails. His commitment is, un, is never fails, is unfailing. His perseverance, his steadfastness, he is on a journey to make you into what his purpose calls you to be. You know, this is a particular ministry calling that I was talking about, but the calling of being made ready as a bride. He is unfailingly committed to that. He's committed to making his bride ready for the marriage. In his commitment, there's another point about that. In his commitment to make the bride ready, Christ is committed to sanctifying his bride, that she might be presented to him holy and blameless. Uh, remember it says, let me go back to Ephesians 5 here again. He gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. That he might sanctify her. And going back to uh, the, the lady's dream, she tried to put on the makeup herself and she couldn't do it. It took, it took the bridegroom putting it on her. It, he might sanctify. Now, yes, there's a part we pray, pay, play in that. We have to play the, a part in that. But he is the sanctifier. We are the sanctifier, if you will. We have to respond to his work. But he is committed, he is committed in love to sanctify us because it's out of the sanctification process that we will be made ready. It's out of this sanctification process that we will be made ready. See, we look at our, and I've mentioned this before, but this is in the notes. Many believers, myself included, look at our weaknesses, our frailties, our sin, and self issues and wonder if we can ever become the spotless bride Paul writes about. The point for here is that Christ is committed in his great love for his bride to the sanctification process. So if the bride will submit to his leadership, she will be made ready. I don't know, that's a, that's a touching truth to me. The next point is nourishing and cherishing the bride. You know, he says this, verse 30, because we are members of his body, but then in verse 31, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is great, but I am speaking with reverence to Christ and the church. And uh, I went too, a little bit too far. Let me, let me start over again. Verse 28. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. And so what, you know, the point here for us is that Christ nourishes and cherishes us in the sanctification process to make ourselves ready. He nourishes us and he cherishes us. He's ever committed uh, to do that. Now let's look at the word cherish first and then we'll look at nourish. The definition of cherish helps us understand Christ's attitude toward his betrothed bride. Cher the, the Greek word translated cherish is thalpo, 
uh, which primarily means to heat or to soften by heat or to keep warm as a, a bird covering their young with their feathers. Uh, with this as its primary meaning, it carries the meaning of to cherish with tender love or to foster with tender care. Uh, the same Greek word is used in 1 Thessalonians 2.7 and it reads, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. And the New American Standard translation reads this way of that same verse. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Now let's look at the English definition of cherish. It means to hold or to treat as dear, to feel love for, and then synonyms are adore, love, worship, appreciate, prize, treasure, and value. And so when Christ cherishes us, his bride, it reveals his tender care in maturing the bride to become holy and blameless. It's like he, he tender. It's like he treats us so dearly and gently. Now I, mean, I know sometimes there's a there's a harshness there, but even in that there's a cherishing there. The overall riding, overriding issue is his love and his cherishing, his care, his tender nurture uh, of us, and so that's the attitude he has for us. You know, he, there, yes, there's a sanctification process. But in that, he's maturing us with a great love and affection and appreciation and a tenderness, kind of like a, a nursing mother treats her, her infant. There's a tenderness there. Uh, you know, my, my youngest son, as I'm speaking this, my youngest son uh, and his wife just had a, a baby, their first child, uh, about not quite two months ago. And I'm so, it's so enjoyable to watch both of their attitudes, but I, I'm thinking of him really in this illustration is how much he loves that baby. Uh, he sends us pictures multiple times a day of, of him and they live on the other side of town so we don't get to see him, uh, but maybe two or three times a month or something like that. Uh, but he's, uh, he just so cares for him and he holds him. And, um, you know, that baby, I don't think he's touched the ground much. He's uh, been held almost throughout the whole six weeks. But we see that, in, in, you know, in a, in a certain way, there's that same tender care uh, that Christ has for us uh, to, to cherish us. Uh, and he also, he nourish, nourishes us, his church and his Christ nourishes his church in its quest for maturity. So he nourishes and cherishes. And so let's look at nourish. Um, the word translated nourish uh, means to nourish up to maturity, to nourish up to maturity. The English dictionary defines nourish as to provide with food or other substances necessary for growth, health, and good conditions. Um, the same Greek word is, is used one other time in the New Testament, uh, a few verses later in Ephesians 6, 4. The verse reads, Fathers, do not pro provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word translated nourish in Ephesians 5, 29 in the context of Christ and his church is translated bring up in the context of rising a child, raising a child to maturity. Uh, and so, so what this says is that he, he, you know, he has that tender care, the cherishing, but he's nourishing us in that tender care. He's feeding us. He's leading us to, to, so that we can grow step by step uh, into maturity. He has a plan for us uh, to lead us into maturity, just like you would not uh, give a one-month-old baby a steak dinner because they're not ready for the meat uh, you have to give them the milk. But as they get older, they can eat the, the meat and we can eat the meat of the word. And so there's a, there's a gentle 
nourishing that goes out of his cherishing character and love over us to lead us into maturity. He's sanctifying us, but he's doing it out of, a lo out of love with a cherishing, uh, nourishing uh, attitude there. So summarizing Christ's loving work toward his bride, he has us on a journey to be the bride made ready. He loves us. He has a goal. He loves us. He's committed to us. He nourishes us. He, 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 uh, uh, he uh, cherishes us. He does all these things. But he has us on that journey. So we see his role in this. This is the point I want you to really see. Christ is the leader in this. It's not like he's leading it, leaving it all up to us apart from him. He's leading us on this journey to be made ready. He never quits. He never fails. We may get tired for a while and quit, but he doesn't. He's always on this journey, and he's leading us on it. And so that leads us to the final point of call, uh, we've titled Reverence and Submission. To become his glorious bride without spot or wrinkle, uh, believers must in great reverence submit to Christ's loving leadership. Let's, let's, uh, let me read this last verse in chapter 5. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself. And let the wife see to it that she respect, or in really probably the word is reverence, her husband. Uh, and we also see in verse 22, wives be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. So we're, uh, we're putting this in the context of Christ and his bride. The betrothed bride needs to reverence Christ and submit to his leadership. He's on a journey to lead us, but we have to submit. We have to submit to his leadership. We have to be subject to him in reverence. And, you know, the church, the, much of the church today doesn't reverence Christ. It, it's like you, anything goes. You know, the, you can live as close to the edge of sin as possible. There's no reverence uh, of the Lord in, his, in terms of his holiness and of the journey and all that. That has to change. The church has to reverence Christ as the preeminent centrality of all the universe. And out of that, as he gently and, and, and carefully leads us step by step by step through the sanctification process, in order to be presented holy and blameless before him, we must, be, we must live our life in subjection and submission to his voice and to his word. Now, there's a whole uh, arena of things that go into that. Yes, the scriptures. We need to abide and meditate in the scriptures so that we uh, can be obedient and submissive to, to him, but into his person as well, into his voice and, uh, and all of these things. We have to follow him wholeheartedly. He will lead us. It's Ephesians 5. He will lead us to be that spotless bride without wrinkle, totally blameless at the coming of the Lord. He will lead us that way. We have to trust that in his love and in his great care, he will lead us through this sanctification process to make us ready to be the eternal wife of Christ. But to do that, we must live our life in submission and subjection to Christ. There's no other way to do it. There's no other way. We can't live a life independent of his voice, independent of his word, independent of what he would be speaking to us, resisting and rebelling everything that he would say because the price is too great and then expect to be made ready to be that holy and blameless bride. He is the leader. We are the follower. He leads. He leads in love. He leads in great care. 
He leads knowing what to feed us and how to lead us in every step of the way. He, know, we know, he knows how to do that, and he will lead us very effectively. But we must say yes. We must reverence him as the creator of the universe, the preeminent central uh, man above every man, name, name above every name. We must reverence him in that role and say yes and follow him. And as we do that, he will make us ready. He will make us ready. So let me summarize these two, these two sessions. One, we say that Paul's writings are in agreement with what we have taught uh, and from the book of Revelation and from the Gospels. They are consistent with what we've taught in this class. He's not preaching a different message than John did or the angel in revealing to John or Jesus did in the Gospels. If there's a consistency there uh, that the bride must make herself ready. But, and then the other aspect of it is we taught is that this Ephesians 5 reveals the role of Christ leading us to make ourselves ready. We don't have to do it independently. We don't have to do it separate from him. We follow his leadership. And as we do it, we trust that he will lead us to victory, to be that bride without spot, without wrinkle, holy and blameless in every way. Father, make it be this case in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen.